Okay, so Professor Carlos um, Gershenson is a professor at the Computer Science Department at the Institute for Research in Applied Mathematics and Systems at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Uh, there he leads the Self-Organizing System Lab and is also affiliated uh, at the Center of Complexity Sciences at his university. He was a visiting professor at MIT and at Northeastern University and also at ITMU in Russia. Uh, in addition to his vast background in sciences, he also studied philosophy and his research interests include complex systems, self-organization, urbanism, evolution, cognition, and of course, philosophy. So Carlos, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. It uh, has been a very interesting conference. So uh, I want to speak about post-pandemic cities. Um, what have we learned or what haven't we learned from uh, the recent months that have shaken the world? And uh, I mean, many people have warned that, uh, let's say the, the pandemic has just made evident several weaknesses that different systems already had. Healthcare systems, democratic systems, international cooperation systems and so on. Um, and as he has been mentioned already, there's a crisis in, in democracy and governance in general, uh, but also let's say uh, it has made evident that there, uh, there's a problem with trust in science and um, we're not able to cooperate at all the levels that we need to cooperate. And uh, if we can't deal with the pandemic, we, we won't have a chance with uh, climate change. Um, I mean, the, in, in this caricature, the recession, I, I don't think it's as big as, as the pandemic. It's already recovering, but the, the pandemic, it, it will still continue to, to create much havoc. Um, and the climate emergency, it, it's not only the natural disasters, but it will lead to social, economic and migration crises. And if, if we don't have a global cooperation based on science, it will be, well, it, it is already being uh, a mess, but uh, let's say the, the, the pandemic will be something uh, much smaller uh, in comparison to, to all the transformations that we'll, that we'll live through in, in the next few decades. Um, and so, so I want to elaborate on, on what challenges we face and what can we do to, to address them. And uh, the pandemic offered an urban reset when uh, during the first months uh, of spring last year, uh, Many, many countries enter lockdowns and let's say uh, many changes occurred that uh, hadn't occurred because th there was not such a trigger. So for example, we had a technology to work remotely, but many people didn't embrace it. And once we had it thrust upon us, then we just had to work remotely and study remotely. So um, this was not thinkable in the previous pandemic in 2009 uh, with the H1N1 flu. Uh, we just resigned and let it rip. And fortunately, it was not so deadly as, as this one. But now we are able to, to take some measures against the pandemic that just 10 years before we were unable to do. So uh, it's also... Uh, constant process of, of learning uh, that has to go together with, with technology available. And just one example, but similar issues apply to, to other urban problems. Uh, in the first months of the pandemic, uh, public transport became less appealing because it pr uh, proved the risk of contagion, even when if everyone is wearing masks and you have proper ventilation, the risk is not as high as uh, basically the one you will face when you reach your destination. Um, of course, it depends where, you, where you're going, but let's say many people who were using public transport might decide, okay, now I will buy a car, but many cities uh, develop emergent infrastructure for promoting cycling because let's say open air ventilation, uh, it's safe. Um, many people decided to, to, to use bike lanes. So cities like London, Paris, Mexico uh, made uh, temporary infrastructure, but actually 
many cities made this temporary infrastructure permit. So that allowed, let's say, this reset allowed um, cycling infrastructure to be built that even when it had been demanded by different sectors of the population, the government didn't take action. And let's say the pandemic was a good excuse for, for finally making this uh, feasible. Well, other uh, solutions uh, that uh, were implemented were flexible schedules and home commuting. And the question is how much of these changes that, uh, let's say, are positive for mobility and were triggered by the pandemic will remain as things slowly go back to a new normal. Um, because we could just go back to the terrible traffic that we had, as many cities have done, or maybe some people uh, will realize, hey, it's, it's not that bad to, to work some days from home. Let's reduce uh, the, the number of commutes per day per worker. And uh, let's say that, that would have several positive effects on, on citizens and on cities. And uh, concerning governance, uh, much has been said uh, about the uh, obsolescence of democracy, but unfortunately, it's the best game in town. And also, um, um, people already mentioned uh, the possibility of having cities as uh, more sovereign. And let's say uh, there's this book, uh, When Mayors Will Rule the World, and it speaks about the uh, many of the actions that are taken that have a real effect in in cities are taken by mayors not by governors or by presidents and we shall also mention uh, this and uh, let's say a, a counter aspect of this is uh, also was also mentioned by Luis that uh, cyberspace, cyberspace reduces the spatial aspect of cities so in principle uh, well, not in principle, in practice, there are already some virtual nations that are emerging because they don't need to be geographically uh, close to each other. And simply citizens that have certain affinity might decide, hey, let's cooperate in a virtual na nation and organize politically and make decisions at the collective level that is not constrained to, to uh, geographical location. Uh, I know also it was mentioned that decision making and governance has to be taken at, at multiple scales um so just for example in mexico city or in the mega city uh around mexico it's it's a problem um so if you consider the metropolitan area it's about 23 million people but if you consider the metropolitan areas around more like mike but he was uh, speaking yesterday uh, about uh, the Pearl River Delta. If you take the similar approach in Mexico, then the cities uh, and mega cities around, uh, it would be like 35 million people. And of course you have local municipal state and federal coordinations and the decisions that are taken at one scale that not necessarily the best uh, taken at that scale. So for example, uh, politically, Mexico City has less than half of the population of the metropolitan area, and more than half of the population is in the state of Mexico. And there is uh, basically no coordination for the pandemic, for public transport, for housing, uh, for land use, and so on. So even if one administration makes the best efforts, more than half of the population is, uh, let's say, with, with different politics. So of course, this, this is a challenge. And um generalizing these problems uh we can say that these are related to, to complexity as uh carlin already mentioned complexity is created by interactions uh, uh, which make components of a system difficult to separate uh, these interactions generate novel information which limits the predictability of complex systems uh, just like cities uh, and this novel information in many cases basically changes the problem so it, it makes, if you already predicted something, if you planned for something, probably it will be obsolete because the information that will be generated by interaction has not been produced yet. So even if you have uh, uh, certain tendencies, well, tendencies tend to change. So um, we need urban systems that are able to, to adapt. Um, and with globalization and evolution, we are having an increase in complexity because there are more interactions, there, uh, there is more change. 
uh, more new information. Therefore, we require more adaptation. Uh, and one method that achieves this is self-organization. So uh, I'm not going to speak about this now, but just to mention that we have several uh, proposals for using self-organization for uh, building adaptive urban systems in areas such as public transport regulation or traffic light coordination, autonomous vehicles, uh, and so on. And th this, this is very much with uh, variety. Uh, basically, the governance, or we could say it from a cybernetic perspective, the control of a city uh, does not have the required variety of the system it's trying to control. Um, variety can be understood simply as the possible number of states that a system has. So Ashby's law of requisite variety states that in order for a controller to be effective, it needs to have at least as much variety as that is uh, which is trying to control. And this doesn't happen in cities or in nations. Uh, the complexity is too high, so they have too many possible states. Many of these are unpredictable. And traditional uh, governments uh, that are hierarchical, they're very slow to adapt. Uh, and basically, that's why uh, many problems arise and, and, and we fail. So, so we need uh, to increase, well, traditional approaches to reduce the complexity or the variety of the system you're trying to control. This is not so easy in cities. Also, actually, that's precisely what cities do, uh, like traffic, uh, traffic regulation reduces the variety. So we agree that we will drive on specific side of the street or that we will stop uh, or we'll, we'll behave in a certain way. And this reduces the variety and facilitates uh, interactions and reduces complexity. But uh, another way to increase the complexity of the controller, but of course, this, this uh, cannot be made with traditional hierarchical bureaucracies. Uh, and self-organization is one way of achieving this. And uh, I, I believe Charlie was going to speak about the relevance of, of sensors. Uh, I hope that he, he will join us soon. Uh, and of course, in order to make proper decisions, you, you need information. Uh, but that information is not enough because you, you can have real-time information like, I don't know, there's a, a riot in East LA. Uh, yeah, okay, but what do you do about it? <laughs> so you, you need not only real-time information or let's say uh, information as fast as it uh, becomes necessary, but you need algorithms to make decisions. These algorithms, uh, of course, can be assisted by artificial intelligence, but they don't have to be, uh, let's say, without humans in the loop. Uh, actually, they, they should be desirably with humans in the loop, uh, but algorithms process this information and might help uh, with the decision making. Uh, and even if you have, okay, we should do this, but you don't have the means to do it, then you are not solving the problem. So you also need agents so that they can implement a, a desired solution for, for a problem. So this is something that we, we put forward in a, in a chapter of a book that Juval is, is editing and should be published soon. And just to conclude, um, urban and global problems have solutions, but I, I believe that the greatest challenge is the human factor, not technological factor. Uh, so we must solve governance for, for the rest. So, uh, I mean, we, we have for decades uh, known about climate change, about uh, renewable energy sources, but we don't implement it as if the world was ending, even when it is, <laughs> well, it's transforming. Uh, so even in spite of having solutions for many of the problems that we face, uh, the social resistance to change is one obstacle that we haven't managed to overcome. Um, and I, of course, we can speculate about how could we achieve uh, global coordination or global governance in order to, to solve these problems. Um, but I, uh, I don't know, maybe it's also better that we are not able to implement every idea that we have uh, uh, as quickly as possible, because also as we are more capable of solving problems, uh, we're also more capable of making new ones. In the sense that if it was very easy to make geoengineering experiments, then very probably some of those experiments would go awry and we would be with some, I don't know, terrible situation with 
uh, some gas covering the atmosphere to reduce global warming or something like that. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and uh, I'll be glad to, to take questions and comments. Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, any questions? Yes, Carmen. Sorry, I was just clapping my hands for a really good oh. talk. I don't have a specific <laughs> question. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, um, no, you have to ask. Thank you. <laughs> any um, real questions? Um, so I have a small question. Um, in the previous session, I raised a question regarding the temporal scale. And it also applies to your lecture and also the scale of um, the human factor. How does this is a parameter in the theory? Because yes. if we're talking about cities, for example, so what is a city? What determines the boundary of the cities and the agents within it? If there is a municipal boundary, does it mean that these are different? So I understand the question. Yes, yeah, it's, it's very rele relevant because uh, let's say with complexity, we're not having only more interactions, but we are having faster interactions. So change is, uh, let's say, not only more prevalent, but it comes faster. So it reinforces what I mentioned about adaptation because let's say with traditional urban planning, where let's say you have several years ahead, uh, you assume that certain tendencies will be followed most probably we know that they won't be followed because in many cases your prediction actually uh, changes the system that you're trying to predict uh, like in the stock market um, so we need systems that are able to adapt by themselves and that, that's one of, of the benefits of self-organizing systems because instead of trying to solve a problem you regulate the interactions of a system and then um, those components of the system will find constantly solutions as the problem changes. Um, so, so that's the, the main approach of self-organization towards solving urban problems. In, uh, in the papers I, I cited, the, these ideas are, are better explained. Thank you very much. Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Ethel. Good to be here. Thank you, Carlos, for a very inspiring and um, thought-provoking um, presentation. Um, I'm always wondering myself um, regarding this pandemic situation that um, whether there will be a post-pandemic city. Are we on, on on the one hand? Are we going to have a permanent pandemic city with all these um, variations of virus and, and and uh, you know what and um and on the other hand um how are the cities as very very resilient systems going to react to this um after the crisis are they going to bounce back and recover like from many other crises before this and this is of course what helen copeless wrote last year in environment and planning b um, and is this um, so? So I'm asking basically, uh, what do you think about this situation? How do you see that this situation is um, um, very different from other crises before, um, like other pandemics or wars or such, that we are, for example, facing multiple crises at the same time? So kind yes. of um, that's that's a yes. small question. <laughs> yes, I, I think that. Well, Already at the beginning of the pandemic, it was clear that, uh, let's say, even if it finished, the, we would never go back to normal, let's say, to life as it was in 2018, it wouldn't be that way. And the, the questions were like, well, how different will it be and how long will it take <laughs> to get there? Uh, and as, as time has passed, we, we, let's say, we've gained more information. Uh, but I think that the, the analogies you make are, are correct. Uh, many cities already have uh, transformed them, themselves, perhaps uh, visually not as much as, for example, Paris after the Second World War, or let's say if, if you have a city bomb, then of course, let's say the, the changes will be very visible. But uh, I think people have changed a lot in their, in their behaviors uh, I don't know 
how much they will change back because let's say we're, we're not going back to let's say how they call it in mexico a, a new normal uh after the pandemic passed i mean the, the pandemic is still here just that we we got exhausted and let's say we are trying to adapt more or less okay how can kids go back to school minimizing risk but we will risk them anyway um how much can we distribute vaccines and some people don't want to get vaccines some people want to get vaccines but then there aren't enough uh how we react with you know, new variants and so on so many people have said that let's say uh the virus will become endemic and there will be new waves and of course the, then the question is how which actions will we take preventive and reactive to control these new outbreaks that will have and actually not only of this uh, virus but any other disease that emerges will we do better or not and i i think that not i mean if if right now there was another virus emerging in some other part of the city of the world i think right now we would do worse than we did a year and a half ago because basically we're exhausted uh so let's say if, if ever if someone starts speaking about lockdowns many people already get blocked and say no it's not possible we'll deal with it the old way uh let the the plague uh ravage through several continents uh that's it um but i mean in, in a few years we'll see i i think that the biomedical advances uh, have been great so the, the advances in vaccines have been amazing so very probably those tools that have been developed because of the pandemic will help us face better the next pandemics. Um, but yet the, the speed is accelerating because of uh, increasing complexity. So our systems need to uh, to have precisely the requisite variety to, to cope with that speed and with that complexity. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Um, you added that we have time for other questions or we need to move on we do have time if okay. anybody wants okay any other questions yes Owen. yeah thank you carlos uh, and also Luis. before i want to try and connect uh, the two last lectures and to ask you carlos about the impact of the uh, cyber world of the digital world on the uh, on the pandemic, and it appears to be that you know the uh, defenses or the mechanisms that Luis was talking about uh, were actually crumbling during the pandemic, and uh, people were exposed in into the digitization or the the, the empires of, of 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 digital power in a much more much weaker position during the pandemic, and this appears from the global south, the countries that don't have great institutions and great publics. I wonder whether you can tell us about Mexico and how um, the power of, of, of the centers of uh, digital uh, management, algorithm government and all that, what happened to them during the last year and a half? Yes, uh, well actually also like in other countries, uh, the pandemic was politicized in the sense that people in favor of the government were kind of uh adopting and promoting the measures that the government did independently of their scientific basis and people against the government were saying no this is let's say we shouldn't do this uh the the doctors in charge don't know what they're doing uh but let's say with political motives and uh, actually we, we we're finishing a paper uh analyzing uh on twitter social interactions well the the main idea was to study enemy networks and of course twitter is a, a good place for that um and in in other countries it, it was even worse i mean still it is in in the united states that um if you're a republican then you almost assume that you shouldn't get vaccinated and it's like well <laughs> how is one thing related to the other or, or you shouldn't wear a mask and uh it, it, it's it's very interesting for me to see that um people kind of aggregate together their political views with uh decisions of public health that uh and actually how politicians exploit that situation to seek their own benefit 
and, and to harm their opponents. Because uh, in these situations, let's say public health, uh, economy, climate emergency, all, all the politicians should be working towards the same goal, no? To, let, let's eliminate the virus, let's improve the economy and so on. And, uh, and it's very difficult for them to agree. And it's like, well, uh, <laughs> can't we change the, that type of government which kind of gets stuck in uh, political vendettas instead of solving problems that we all want to be solved and both parties want to be solved? Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it wasn't much different from, from other countries. Uh, let's say some things better, some things worse. But uh, yeah, the manipulation of information through online media is, uh, has become a, a very prolific topic of research because of the strong effects it has had with Brexit, with Trump, with the pandemic. Um, and many of the benefits that the internet brings, as Luis mentioned, uh, also bring new challenges. And we don't have solutions for those challenges yet. And it's not clear that we will have them soon. So, so it's like new things that we have to, to learn to live with.